Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. Senator Sherrod Brown, a Democrat from Ohio, is with us. Senator Brown is in his third term in the United States Senate. A Democrat from Ohio? You've got to be kidding. Republicans won Ohio in six out of the last 10 presidential elections. But Sherrod Brown has been a consistent winner in his state because of his shining progressivism and also his appeal to blue collar workers. He has won election after election. Sherrod Brown has written a marvelous new book updated this year called Desk 88, in which he presents portraits of eight United States senators who occupied the same mahogany desk where he sits in the Senate chamber. All of the eight senators are, of course, progressives. We're pleased to welcome Senator Sherrod Brown to the program. Well, first, uh, Senator, congratulations on your book. It's really a marvelous read. Uh, can you tell us uh, something about how you came to write it? It's about eight senators, and uh, I guess most of them in the mid uh, 20th century, all of them progressives. Uh, and all of whom sat at uh, your mahogany desk, desk number 88 in the Senate chamber. Yeah, yeah. First, start, start with the fact that all eight senators, because that's who was in the Senate in the 1920s, 30s, into the 80s, were, um, were white men, understand that. Uh, there will be people seated at this desk that are progressive women and progressive people of color, I assume, in the future. But um, I, in, in 2007, I came to the Senate. I was a freshman. Much of the Senate at the beginning is done by seniority. The committees you sit on, the office you occupy, and the, the desk on the floor. And then we were down to the final 10 desks for the 10 freshmen. And someone had told me that senators, because I really didn't care where I sat. You're not sitting behind a post at Yankee Stadium or Fenway Park or Progressive Field in Cleveland. You've got a pretty good seat. So I pulled out desk drawers because I'd heard senators carve their names in their desk drawers. And I came across the name McGovern, South Dakota, Hugo Black, Alabama. And then it just said Kennedy, no first name, no state. So Ted Kennedy sat nearby and I went over to him and I said, Ted, come here a second. And he walked over, I said, which brother's desk is this? And he said, well, it's gotta be Bobby's because I have Jack's desk. So um, my, my wife and I have always sort of thought that you really wanna know what happened before you were there in a job or in a community or whatever. So I read it, she sent away and I read a bunch of books about the Senate. And over then, over the next several years, I decided I would choose eight of these senators and write about how they contributed to a much more progressive America on civil rights, on workers' rights, on the environment, uh, on all the things that, that I think we should care about in this country. So there were other senators who sat at desk 88, whom you didn't include in your book. Uh, did you um, only include the leading progressive senators? Yeah, I mostly did. I didn't. My first rule was I didn't want to include anybody with whom I was serving at the time, because some senators sat at this desk and then moved to another desk, as as people typically do. Um, but I just looked at the eight of the I, I, eight was no magic number. I ended up settling on eight. Um, took me ten years to write it. If I had done more, it would have taken longer, I guess. But mm -hmm. I just was was attracted to these eight for a lot of different reasons, and um, there are a couple others that could have been included. Uh, but I, I just thought these eight represented a breadth of the country from Idaho to Massachusetts, they, uh, to Rhode Island, they, two Southern senators, uh, Senator Gore Sr. Uh, was one of the Southern, Southern senators and Hugo Black, who was the first one I wrote about. Um, he was um, one later on the Supreme Court and all of these senators were uneven in their public service. I mean, uh, Hugo Black and, and Al Gore started off not particularly friendly to civil rights and by the end were, were heroes in many ways on civil rights and on civil liberties. And I, I mean, all, all of these senators had moments when I would not have celebrated them and they all had maybe greater moments when I would have. Well, uh, Bobby Kennedy, for example, uh, was an aide to Senator McCarthy, and um, he certainly evolved uh, with the passage of time. Well, Bobby, yeah, Bobby Kennedy. You, I think you could argue all the, the three brothers, the three Kennedy brothers, none was a particularly good senator early in their careers. Uh, Jack was not an especially not a notable senator when he ran for president. Uh, Bobby really never served very long in the Senate and was always sort of antsy and didn't really want to stay. 
and Ted, the first 20 years of his Senate service was, was adequate, but I would argue Ted Kennedy in his last 20 years, more or less 20, not quite, was perhaps the best Senator in American history. So um, Bobby worked for McCarthy and I, I read it in the midst, just coincidentally reading a biography of McCarthy and Bobby doesn't look all that good in this biography. He didn't play a major role, but he was there. And then Bobby wiretapped uh, Dr. King on behalf of, probably on behalf of J. Edgar Hoover, at least allowed it as attorney general. So, um, and then Bobby became the, you know, the one of the most compassionate, empathetic uh, elected officials I've ever seen in the last five years, the last, well, he's only in the Senate for uh, five, six, seven, not even four years. Um, and was was terrific by by at least my measurements as a progressive. And under uh, John Kennedy's administration, he supported uh, the surge in Vietnam and later became a, a vocal advocate against the war. Yeah, and uh, interestingly, progressives, people like Eleanor Roosevelt and other progressives in New York, when Bobby ran for the Senate in 64, were not especially supportive of Bobby, especially in a primary, but some even in the general election. He ran against a moderate Republican back before that species was extinct. And he really, um, he didn't, uh, he wasn't somebody that progresses around the country looked up to at all in those days. They really thought much less of him than that. It was only after going to South Africa and especially, and I tell the story of his first trip into the Mississippi Delta uh, uh, and, and where he um, he really became his, his empathy and caring and passion began to show. And in some ways it was the first time Bobby could be his own man because he was always the little brother for Jack until Jack's assassination. And Bobby of course never got over that. He lived only five, less than five years more after that. And, and Bobby, um, but it, it certainly changed Bobby and it certainly allowed Bobby to sort of be his own person when, when he hadn't been in the beginning of his career. When you mentioned uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, there was a senator from Mississippi. He was a racist. His name was Theodore Bilbo. And he called Eleanor Roosevelt the first lady of Liberia. I mean, he was ac actually a, a, a virulent racist. Uh, and he was uh, ousted, really, from the Senate by one of the eight senators in your book, uh, Glenn Taylor, a country and Western singer from uh, uh, Idaho, where there was a small uh, African-American population. Uh, tell us a little bit about Taylor. I can understand why he caught your fancy. Uh, that, that's exactly right. It was that story that caught my fancy about Taylor. There's not much written by Taylor or about Taylor, sort of one book each. My guess is nobody watching this has ever heard of Glenn Taylor. I had not either at the time. Um, he came to the Senate. He lost several races. He was a country Western singer the Glendora Singers with his wife, Dora, Glenn and Dora, their son, if you're a New York baseball fan or a Seattle baseball fan, I guess you appreciate this. Their son's name was Dora spelled backwards or A-Rod. And um, mm -hmm. I caught up with A-Rod in his seventies, a retired dentist in California and had some pretty intimate conversation with him about his father. But his father lost, I believe six elections, one one came to the Senate in 1944 in January 1947, when senators are just as a matter of course sworn in. He stood up to object to the new term swearing in of perhaps then, this is quite quite an achievement in a, in a sarcastic way, perhaps the most racist senator in the 20th century. And there were of course many, and his name was Theodore Bilbo from Mississippi. And he challenged his, seat, his credentials to sit and the, the, it was put off for another day. Bilbo was sick. Bilbo was never sworn into that. I think his third might've been his fourth term. And Glenn Taylor went on then, as, as, um, as you know, Jim, to become the running mate for, um, for Henry Wallace in 1948, where he went to Mississippi, went to Alabama campaigning in front of integrated audiences. Glenn Taylor as a sitting Senator in his fifth year and his, in his fourth ending his fourth year. And he ended up being arrested by Bull Connor and spending the night in the Birmingham jail for Dr. King from which Dr. King wrote his letter um, uh, 15 years later. And Glenn Taylor's dad, I mean, Glenn Taylor's son, Aaron, whom I talked to in California, uh, told me that story about um, he always, about Bull Connor and uh, the jail that Glenn Taylor spent the night in as a presidential, vice presidential candidate. I can see why you're proud to uh, sit at the desk that Taylor occupied. Now, of the eight, did you know any of them? 
Did you um, ever know them personally? I, I certainly, I knew of seven of them. I didn't know who Glenn Taylor was before I started the book. Um, I knew personally only one of them. I think I might've met Proxmire when I was like a teenager, but I didn't know him. The only one I really knew was McGovern. And McGovern, um, I got to know McGovern well in the last decade of his life. So there, there are a number of, I mean, I did a lot of, I read of probably 150 books for this book. And I um, also, I didn't, um, and, and I had a number of interviews about, about pretty much all of them. The only one I really got to spend time with and could actually put, put quotes in the book directly from him was George McGovern. And one that, one that I, um, I, I kind of live with as a candidate when you run for office, you think about this. Um, McGovern in 72 ran for president, history knows, and won one state. Uh, Massachusetts and the District of Columbia. 12 years later, Walter Mondale ran for president, won one state, Minnesota, his own in the District of Columbia. So um, Kennedy or um, McGovern's telling me this story. We're sitting in the, having dinner one night in the Capitol and he said, and he said, Walter Mondale came up to me after his loss in 1970, in 1984. And he said, how long does it take to get over this, George? And McGovern said, I'll let you know. Because I think when you lose in a, humiliating sort of way with that kind of a margin you probably really never get over it. Uh, do you see parallels between uh, McCarthy and uh, Donald Trump? Uh, you mentioned McCarthy and uh, uh, what do you see? The, the humiliating your opponents, attacking your opponents by name, um, just always, always, always dividing, thinking you win by dividing the country. Uh, McCarthy was all about that and McCarthy was in even more than Trump, I think, into ruining people's careers. But um, surely there is the, the um, and I, I would say that it's all, that they, they're, both, they're both bullies, McCarthy and Trump. And as bullies often are, they're both cowards. Not all cowards are bullies, but all bullies are cowards. And I would say Trump and McCarthy, what they have in common more than anything is each is a bully to people whom they can pick on. And each is a coward when you shine the light directly on them. What about uh, this bodyguard of lies that seem to uh, surround both of them? I mean, you have in your book uh, when one of the eight senators, Herbert Lehman, decides to confront McCarthy because uh, McCarthy had a purported book with lists of communists in the government. And Lehman walked over to him and said, let me see it, let me see it. And McCarthy kind of rebuffed him. Uh, so uh, isn't that... Uh, a parallel there because uh, uh, McCarthy as well spun conspiracy theories and uh, tried to scare up votes and, uh, and was a demagogue, very much like Trump. I think, Joe, when, when people are demagogues, when they divide, they often, and when they engage in hate speech, uh, so often they don't tell the truth, so often they, they cower when light is shown on them, uh, so often they they live by deceit and destruction. And um, it caught up to McCarthy, who, who last years of his life, he was pretty much, uh, he was a pretty pathetic creature. And it's catching up to Trump. I mean, right now, Trump is pretty pathetic. as a guy that, that um, is so discredited. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a total rejection election, although 80 million people more than any time in history voted for, for his opponent, for Joe Biden. But it is a time that history, history clearly will show it's not just history will show Trump in a negative light. One of the things that I, I, it's almost a wonder of the world to me to watch my Republican Senate colleagues, um, grown men and a few women, but Republicans, mostly men, appearing to walk upright, yet um, are able to do that with no spines. And I just think that it's one of the things history will comment on the most emphatically that this, this crowd of politicians who are in the Republican Party overwhelmingly with exceptions of Mitt Romney and Lisa Murkowski, a few others, that they have been so cowed by this president that they, that they, um, they disappear or they cower um, when, when confronted by reporters. Uh, now, you're, uh, Sherrod, a, a, a prominent progressive, uh, three times elected to the Senate from, face it, a, a conservative state. Uh, and uh, you're anti-gun, you're pro-choice, you're for marriage equality, you're against systemic racism. Uh, what's been the secret of your success the last time around you won by seven points? 
Um, well, it's not a landslide, but it's enough. So um, I, I, I told a story in the book. I was sitting in the, during the 2000 election, this illustrates it may perhaps the best. I was in, in I mean, I, I know I'm beatable. I don't ever think I'm unbeatable. And that's one of the reasons maybe I've won, but I'm not was a sitting, landslide, but enough to avoid a recount. Right, right, for sure. In 19, in 2000, I was sitting at the at a Ford plant in Avon Lake, Ohio, a city 30, 25 miles west of Cleveland. And um, it, it, during a lunch break, I'm sitting with six or seven UAW members and right before the 2000 election, and we're just sitting, sitting there, one of the guys says, who are you voting for? And they went around the table, Gore, 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 Bush, Gore, Gore. And the guy that was voting for Bush, somebody said to him, well, why are you voting for Bush? He said, well, Gore, Gore wants to take my gun. And the guy next to me kind of bumped me on the shoulder and he said, you vote for Sharon. And, he, and he's got the same position on guns as Al Gore. And he said, yeah, but but Brown fights for workers and fights for me and fights for my kids a bill might get my kids opportunity to go to Lorraine Community College. And I just think if progressives, I mean, I'll, I'll never, I, I've been pro-choice my whole career. I always will be. I've been for marriage equality 25 years. I get an F from the NRA. You can do that. A lot of people will never vote for me because of that. Okay. But enough will if you talk to them about the dignity of work and, you know, whether you punch a clock or swipe a badge or work for tips or take care of family members at home, you, you really, you, voters, voters will appreciate that and understand that, that you are on their side and all my politics is about whose side are you on. Now, we had this election and uh, more people voted than ever before in the presidential election, Joe Biden uh garnered 80 million votes more than any presidential candidate in history but donald trump amazingly uh, got almost 74 million votes uh indicating uh how deeply divided uh our country is uh were you disappointed that uh, biden's victory was not more decisive i start with saying it, it was decisive it just wasn't the total repudiation that Many hoped for, many didn't, but um, it was an electoral college landslide by Trump's own definition. It was, the, it was a huge margin, 6 million votes. And that's, it's 6 million and growing, 80 million, as you point out, Jim, and growing. Um, but, it, and, but we lost the Senate. We didn't win the Senate. We didn't lose it. We didn't have it. We lost House seats. We lost state legislative seats in a number of states. I, I, it, was, it, it bothers me that it wasn't the repudiation of the worst president in American history. His bad behavior, his incompetence, and his willingness to lie, and his absolute failure to take responsibility for anything caused for a country of four million, four four percent of the world's population had twenty percent of the world's deaths. That's the lack of president leadership. That's incompetence and malevolence and all that Trump was. And I'm still, I will always, I'll take to my grave um, the belief that I'll the the, the my inability to understand why so many people still voted for him after that performance. Is it possible, do you think, knowing the Senate as you do, for uh, Biden to govern, to get his program through? He's noted for reaching across the aisle, but uh, it seems so many of the Republicans, notably Mitch McConnell, just determined that he's gonna, that Biden is gonna lose, they're gonna make his life miserable. Uh, so, I mean, what are we looking at over the next uh, two years or four years? I'm, I'm, not by the administration. To, I'm not willing to cede that we'll lose in Georgia because I've, I've been on two calls today with Georgians about this race. Um, I think it's they're both 50-50 races. And you could say then that makes the odds one in four, if you call it that way, that we win the Senate. But they're, they're, very, they're very significant odds for us to win. I mean, a, a very decent chance. So if we win those two, it's a 51 to 50 Senate, counting the, the, the vice president. If we don't, um, I don't know. Um, Mitch McConnell said in 2010, he said, my, my major goal in the Senate, or my sole goal, I don't know how he said it, was to make um, Barack Obama one-term president. We've never, I've never seen a majority leader this partisan. I've never seen this, a majority leader, this focused on giving more wealth to the rich and giving more power to the already omnipotent. Uh, and I, um, I don't know what Mitch McConnell will do. I know he can do damage to this country. He's already done great damage to this country. Even after the voters spoke this year, he's still trying to bring the Senate back and do things to make his power more into the future with judges and other, other long-term appointees and nominees. And um, he's, he, 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 he's a, McConnell is 
is a, a danger to this country and done damage to this country. I hope that he doesn't get the opportunity to do more. Do you think he'll seek to block presidential appointments? Uh, well, that's a really good question. I think that he will for sure try to use his power to push Biden to appoint more conservative nominees. He will not do what history has done, and that is giving the new president a wide berth to put his, it's always been a he, obviously, but for forever, we've given the new president um, a pretty wide berth to do what he wants in terms of putting his cabinet in place. I don't know if Mitch McConnell will do that at all. I don't think we know that yet. Do you think they should go back to a supermajority to confirm justices for the Supreme Court? Um, I wish we had. If we had, we would see very different justices. McConnell wouldn't have, you know, the, the Republicans have essentially used the Federalist Society, which is a, you know, is a, is a well-funded group of right-wingers, uh, oil company uh, errors, people like that, that have essentially, well, they've put a list together and sanitized that list. So they're all, they're all young and right-wing. Uh, as the only qualification that matters for judges, for Supreme Court judges, and that's, or not just Supreme Court, but up and down. And, and that's, that's been bad for the country. It's, it makes us even more divided as a country. Well, if you had the votes, would you would consider favorably reorganizing the court to have a larger number of justices? I mean, you can't, Congress can't force them off, but it can uh, change the size of the Supreme Court. It's done that historically. I'm not a lawyer, number one. Number two, we don't have a majority like that. Uh, and I think if the country if the country demands some changes, uh, for instance, do you need, instead of 5-4, instead of uh, you look at jury trials, they have to be unanimous to send somebody to prison. Should the Supreme Court continue to operate under a 5-4 uh, model or something different? I would be willing to consider that. But I'd really have to listen to people that, that know more about the judiciary than I do. Uh, would you, uh, on the premise that Biden doesn't run again, would you uh, consider running for president in uh, uh, 2024? No, I don't really. I love the Senate. I made that decision. My best chance to be president would have been to run this year. Um, I mean, to run in 2019 and 2020. I declined to do it. I did a we call it dignity of work tour of the four states. And I just didn't, there's an old saying that, um, that you, um, that there was a, that there was a secret ballot in the U.S. Senate on who should be the next president. It was a hundred way tie for first. Um, everybody in the Senate has some ambition. You don't get to the Senate without it, but I just didn't in the end want to do what you have to do to run for president. And that is um, your fam, give up your, when you're, I mean, essentially you don't see your family, you, you don't do your job in the Senate for that year and a half or two years. And um, I love the job I'm in. I will stay in this job as long as my health allows it and the, and the voters of Ohio allow it. Um, well, that's the answer I expected you to give. Uh, but uh, let me ask you this. Uh, Biden channeled Lincoln saying he could uh, heal the nation's wounds and uh, um, in effect be a, a unity president. He uh, wanted to be a president for all the people, including those who didn't support him. Uh, without a, uh, a democratic Senate, do you think it's possible for Biden to bring the country together? Oh yeah, I think it is. I think it's, I mean, I, I, you can't do it alone. I mean, Mitch McConnell would need to actually help. Uh, Nancy Pelosi will help, I'll help, Schumer will help. Um, I'm concerned about Mitch McConnell's role. I mean, Mitch McConnell's always looking to the more than more than I mean, I've known a lot of politicians and we all have our our weaknesses. We all are, have our um, prejudices and biases uh, and we all have our goals. But I, I've never seen an elected official. I mean, I, we've had we've had two elected officials right serving right now. President of the United States. I've never met a human being like him with his levels of narcissism and his absolute unwillingness to ever take responsibility for anything that happens. And we have Mitch McConnell, whose goal always is, look at the next election. How do I stay in power? How do I help my people, the oil companies, the NRA, the drug companies, how do I help them stay in power and get richer? Um, that's, that's his mission in life, that to, to make the powerful more powerful and to make the rich more rich. And, uh, he's always looking to do that. 
I think patriotism, the, the putting America first has little to do with that for him. Or he just believes that the rich getting richer is building a better country. I don't really quite understand that. But um, so I, I, I don't know. What, I, I would not predict what McConnell's going to do. Um, but I can guess based on, on what he's done in the past. Based on what he's done in the past. Well, there are many other subjects we might have covered, and perhaps you'll come back and we can go into those as well. But uh, thank you so much for coming by. This has been wonderful. Great, great book, Desk 88, uh, which I urge all our listeners to read. Uh, it's a history. It's a memoir. It tells you a lot about eight senators, and it tells you a lot about Sherrod Brown. Senator Brown, thank you for coming by. This has been just marvelous. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. In the meantime, take care, be well, and all the best. <laughs>